So the last chunk of chapter six deals with uh, how gametes are actually formed since meiosis only occurs in order to make gametes. And in animals, it really boils down to spermatogenesis to form the male sperm and oogenesis to form the oocytes or eggs in females. So meiosis for sperm formation is pretty straightforward. You have your sperm precursor cells that undergo mitosis uh, until there's um, enough of them, and then they will start undergoing meiosis. The spermatocytes become secondary spermatocytes, become the spermatids, which uh, when fully developed become the spermatozoa. And so for each uh, precursor cell, you get four uh, gametes formed, each pretty much equal in uh, DNA and structure. This is not the case for egg formation. So in oogenesis or um, in egg cell production in animals, uh, there's not equal division of the cells. Okay, During meiosis one, uh, the secondary oocyte is formed and then half of the um, DNA is kind of packed into a little tiny polar body, the first polar body that receives almost no cytoplasm, no mitochondria, very little of the cellular apparatus. Um, it's sort of like a little side side um, note here. And then during meiosis two, we actually have another unequal division over here forming the second polar body. Okay, First polar body goes ahead and divides over here. We end up having these sort of three uh, extra cells um, in order to basically conserve all the mitochondria and organelles and everything for that one egg cell. Okay, So uh, this is where you can do some uh, we get into ethical stuff here with uh, testing uh, human embryos for genetic diseases. What they're actually grabbing is the polar body, not actually puncturing the oocyte, but grabbing the little polar body that's generally still attached. And then they can check that for genetic abnormalities. However, that's not gonna be the same, uh, uh, particularly almost almost always it is, but it can be different than the if there's any sort of DNA um, misreplication between those two sister chromatids. And the other interesting thing about oogenesis, so uh, in contrast, spermatogenesis is occurring basically all the time in males uh, with viable testes and everything. There's just a constant production of sperm. Whereas in oogenesis, uh, this happens in the first, this first meiosis here, the commitment to meiosis occurs within the first 12 weeks of um, uh, gestation here. So while you're in utero, ladies, you are producing um, these oocytes here, and then basically meiosis stops, okay, in the second trimester here. Uh, the follicle formation, it just, it arrests at prophase one, okay, so it's, it's sort of committed to meiosis, but doesn't continue meiosis until um, puberty, when you start uh, releasing uh, eggs every 28 days, more or less, and that's the menstrual cycle, is the uh, maturation and release of the mature eggs, okay? So, and then, oh, once you get into um, uh, fertilization here with advent of a sperm, then you're actually able to uh, bear young. That's a pretty clinical way of saying have kids, but uh, yeah, so, and we're going to look at a sort of a contrast picture here. So when we compare these two processes, we can see the, the difference here. The spermatogenesis, our primary spermatocyte, will eventually give us four functional gametes, okay? Where in oogenesis, our primary oocyte is basically going to give us one ovum, okay? Which then fertilized by the other gamete is going to give us a diploid zygote, okay? So fertilization is when we combine the two um, haploid gametes and get us a diploid zygote. So like every process in biology, uh, meiosis is messy and can have errors occur. Mostly we call these uh, errors non-disjunctions. So something is not coming apart when it should. So in order to lower the chance of this happening, there are a bunch of checkpoints, okay? Some occur both in mitosis and meiosis, and some occur only during meiosis. Clicker. Okay. So at the end of the growth phase one, have the growth processes been completed before we start replicating our DNA? The next checkpoint is after DNA synthesis is complete, whether or not replication is finished, if DNA has had any damage to it repaired. And then once we start entering into meiosis, okay? Uh, 
there was a checkpoint in prophase that asks all the are all the homologs paired in synapsed? Are they in the correct spot? Then at the chiasmata checkpoint, are all the homologous chromosomes up forming chiasmata? Are they having crossing over? <clears throat> and then finally, are the microtubules attached to each kinetic core? That also happens in mitosis. So if all these checkpoints are complete, then the process proceeds. Okay. And what can occur is called non-disjunction. Okay. So in meiosis one, the homologous chromosomes are being exchanged and pulled apart. But what can happen is that uh, a fail to disjoin, a non-disjunction can occur. And then you can have uh, one cell that is either called disomic here or N plus one, and one cell that is nullosomic and minus one, less than it's supposed to have. Okay. So normally these two uh, chromosomes, the blue ones, would segregate to opposite poles, but if they go the same pole, that's a problem. The, the other version here is meiosis two, okay, where our sister, our, our homolo homologous chromosomes, our homologs have been separated correctly, but we get to meiosis two, and then this is where there's a non-disjunction in the sister chromatids. The sister chromatids fail to separate, okay? And so again, this one is just missing an allele here, and this one has uh, two copies of the chromosomes, so one cell disomic, the other nullosomic. Uh, different, um, there's different terms to describe that, depending on which textbook you're looking at. So aneuploidy here is what we're talking about uh, when we do not have the proper ploidy, so um, a new is, is wrong, so wrong ploidy, okay? You either have uh, less than you want or more than you want. So normally they segregate to opposite poles, but now so trisomy 21 is one of the rare trisomies that is actually survivable. Most of them are fatal. Uh, what happens usually is that you have your normal chiasma formation and disjunction, okay? But in the um, not genetically inherited forms of Down syndrome in trisomy 21, in most cases uh, there's no chiasma forming and then both of the homologs are actually end up segregating to the same pole. There's this uh, non-disjunction in meiosis one here, but alternatively, uh, let me get my little thing off. The, if there's a distal chiasma, one that forms really far away, it doesn't have enough resistance to um, uh, tension the spindle, and so the homologs are pulled together to um, uh, the same the same pole of the cell, and so that's how you get. But it's not in, it's not inheritable, and it everything should work. Then if that person reproduces, uh, they will have normal um, uh, gametes, and it's not a genetic inherited disorder. Uh, so the third kind is when you actually do have this interesting translocation where a whole chunk of chromosome 21 gets attached to chromosome 14 in most cases and then you have this sort of extra chromosome 21 in your uh, genetic uh, makeup and that can in fact be passed to your descendants okay so you have the normal chromosome 21s but you also have this extra this extra super giant chromosome 14, which is acting as sort of a, a trisomy because of this genetic material is now present in the cell three times. And that actually, that causes familial Down syndrome. Okay. So the risk of trisomy increases with maternal age, okay? Um, the checkpoint where most doctors start to get worried is uh, 40. And you can see here that the, it, um, particularly trisomy 21 after 35, the risk starts increasing, but still you're talking, um, you know, the, the max here is 4.5%. Is it's still relatively low. And there is um, testing uh, that is routinely done in your first or second trimester to determine uh, whether or not your child has any of these um, markers here. So different chromosomes have more uh, higher or lower rates of trisomy, mainly based on where the chiasmata are forming and whether, the, whether or not the lack of that chiasmata forming will cause a non-disjunction event. Okay, so just to summarize again, if we have a non-disjunction in meiosis 1, that's the homologous chromosomes failing to separate, in which case we end up with all of our gametes having an abnormal number of uh, chromosomes there. And if we're in meiosis 2, less severe, uh, only in one of the secondary oocytes do the sister chromatids fail to separate. So half of our gametes have the correct number of um, 
uh, chromosomes, and half of them, only half of the gametes have either a um, uh, null somic or a disomic event. Okay. So um, if you have the pretty much no uh, monosomies, uh, where you only have one chromosome, uh, live. Um, only the trisomies having the extra is a survivable event. Okay, so in this case, we have an abnormal egg cell that has an extra chromosome. When that meets the a normal sperm cell, we end up having this 2n plus 1, where we have an extra of the red chromosomes here in the center. So trisomy 21 is uh, causes Down syndrome here. Uh, it's a tiny chromosome, and this is one where it's not the familial inherited. This karyotype is not the, the um, genetically passed down one. It's the uh, extra paraphomologous chromosomes got pulled into the, um, the gamete, usually the egg cell. Okay. And Patau syndrome, trisomy 13, there's this cleft palate uh, tends to happen along with a bunch of other um, symptoms. And Edwards syndrome is trisomy 18. Uh, trisomy 16 is also possible, but very rare. Okay. So 21, 13, 18 are survivable. Um, they vary in um, uh, how much affected the fetus is. Okay. All other autosome trisomies are fatal. All autosome monosomies are fatal. If you only have one chromosome when you're supposed to have two, um, the, basically uh, the body rejects the uh, pretty early on. It's pretty much, I believe most miscarriages, natural miscarriages are due to there being a trisomy or monosomy very early in the um, gestational cycle. Sex chromosome trisomies are survivable, and we're going to discuss those in the next chapter when we start talking about the sex chromosomes. And so to wrap up chapter six, um, the idea of this evolutionary origins of meiosis and mitosis. How did cells start dividing? Well, if we look at prokaryotes, they don't have this uh, cellular organization. There are no centrosomes or spindle fibers or anything. There's literally, uh, we're going to replicate all of our DNA. We're going to hope that when we contract and pinch our cell into two pieces, that the, half of the DNA goes in one new cell and half the DNA goes in the other. So that's binary fission, okay? And it's very unreliable. There's a very high error rate, but that's cool because you're an E. coli and you're reproducing like a bajillion times per day, and if something is wrong, that's fine. That cell just doesn't survive. Okay, so this worked out fine for prokaryotes and has for um, millions of years, but when you're a slightly more complicated cell, you need to have a more structured um, system in order to survive and pass your genes on to the next uh, generation. So dinoflagellates are interesting. They're considered the most ancient of the uh, eukaryotes, and they're lacking a lot of the cellular mechanisms for mitosis. So they don't have um, centrioles, they don't have uh, tubulin structures. What's the other thing they don't have? Oh, histone proteins. And so they're, they've got this really basic form of mitosis, which is interesting. So we can look at the um, DNA from these guys and figure out what genes are there that might have gotten modified in order to produce... Hi, yes. You're you're so helpful. In order to uh, sort of have be the precursors for proper mitosis. No, you may not sit on my book. Okay, thank you. And uh, there's sort of this really interesting ancient comparison we have. The other thing they have is uh, cilia and flagella. And flagella looks remarkably similar in microtubulin structure to the spindle fibers. So uh, inward facing flagella may have been a uh, precursor to these um, aster formation and, and some such. All right, so we're going to tie this all together back to what we talked about in previous chapters. Okay. So we've got a DNA sequence difference between these two homologous chromosomes. Okay, So these are different alleles at a particular locus. So our AT pair here on this particular spot is going to give us a dominant gene, capital A there, and our uh, when we have a GC pair in that particular spot, maybe via mutation or some sort of loss of function here, uh, we've got a recessive gene that corresponds to this particular change. Okay. 
So we're gonna, the cell's gonna undergo DNA replication. We're gonna get two sister chromatids. They're gonna have nearly identical sequences except for this variation, but that variation does change the protein product in that particular spot, okay? So when we go to perform meiosis, the cell is say a primary oocyte or a spermocyte. Um, we've got these alleles, they're present on the different homologs there. Uh, so we've got, here's our A, a big A and our little A all lined up and ready to start um, meiosis one. Okay, with the blue homolog has this AT base pair on each chromatid and the orange homolog has the GC base pair at that particular locus. Okay. So when these segregate out via meiosis one and two, we end up getting four different possible gametes with the, that combination. Okay, that are gonna segregate apart. The homologous chromosomes are gonna segregate and then the um, uh, sister chromatids are going to just join during meiosis 2, giving us these options. So if you get uh, gamete 1 or 2, we're talking about you're getting the allele A, the big A here, the dominant gene. If you get gamete 3 or 4, you're going to get this recessive gene. Okay. And now this is starting to look like our side of our Punnett square. All right. So what is possible from one parent? Going all the way back up to the change in the DNA sequence. All right, I will see you guys in chapter seven when we talk about sex chromosomes.